Hello, everyone, and welcome to our sixth webinar in the Taming the Dragon series. My name is Daniela, and I'm part of the marketing team here at Zetascale, and I have the pleasure of introducing my colleagues and your host tonight, Julian Ludet, who is our product conductor, and Gabriel Baldoni, who is our runtime lead. Julian is going to be focusing on Zenoflow tonight. Um, he'll be talking about the foundation on which we build Zenoflow, where we are right now, and what are the plans for 2023 while well, Gabriel will also join for the second half of the webinar, and he's gonna have a, a hands-on demonstration on how Xenoflow works and what it can actually do. Just a few reminders about the webinar before we start. Um, I'll add the recordings of the past webinar sessions in the chat in a minute, and you'll also receive an email with the recording of this session in your inbox at the end. If you have any questions, please write them in the comment box on the right side of your screen and Julian and Gabriel will answer them at the end of the session. Um, with this, Julian, please start our sixth and last webinar in the Taming the Dragon series. All right, thank you very much, Daniela. So, hi everyone, thank you for joining us and a happy new year to you all. So today with Gabriele, we're going to talk about uh, Xenoflow. So Xenoflow is a technology we've been working on at Zetascale for more than a year. And we feel right now that it's starting to look like something we want to share with the community to gather feedback. And so this is why we're concluding this uh, session, this series of webinars on Taming the Dragon with it. So first, a reminder, a bit of a reminder as to what Zeno can offer. So Zeno offers seamless communications for the cloud to think continuum. So really Zeno aims at targeting uh, everything that goes from the micro microcontroller up to the de data center. And so to do that, we try to elegantly blend the different programming model, the publish subscribe, uh, queries, which is a generalization of request reply, computations, as well as geo-distributed storages. And in doing that, we want also to be performant, to be efficient, and to be extensible. And it's on that extensibility that uh, Xenoflow is based on and that I would like to focus a bit more. So, as you can see, this is the current landscape of extensions for Xeno. So, we can have databases, as I mentioned. We also have bridges for MQTT, for DDS. And on the top right of your screen, as you can see, uh, we also have here Xenoflow. So Xenoflow, what type of plugin is it? It's allowing data flow programming in Xeno. We really believe that there are synergies between the two, so between data flow programming and Xeno in the context of the cloud to think continuum. And so we feel like developing this plugin and allowing the community to have some data for programming is beneficial. So this is the context and this is the talk that we're going to give today. So reminder of the agenda that Daniela has just said, we are first going to introduce Xenoflow. So what exactly what is data flow programming, exactly what we want to do with Xeno and how we manage Xenoflow. Then, because there are many different terms used in the literature, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about terminology. So what are we going to talk about? Then, as I said, so Xenoflow is for data flow programming, so an application data flow. So how exactly are we going to implement that? Then, because we are on the cloud to think continuum, there is the notion and the problem of deployment. So how do we tackle it with Xenoflow? Then, I will leave the floor to my colleague Gabriele for a more hands-on session with some live coding and a very simple example. But at the same time, we want to show that we can do complex applications in Xenoflow. And so for that, we're going to show two proof of concepts we've been working on. Lastly, we're going to talk about the features of Xenoflow, so where we are right now, and more importantly, where we want to go in 2023. All right, with this out the way, let's get started. So Xenoflow, exactly what does it do? So first we need to talk about data flow programming and why it's relevant. So data flow programming is not a new concept. 
It was introduced back in the 60s by Jack Dennis at MIT. And we can also mention honorably the Gilles Can, uh, a French researcher that was working at CERA, and that came up with Can Processing Networks, bringing another level of formalism to the concept. And so, since in introduction, it has been used as a paradigm to compose applications that operate on streams of data. So in data flow programming, you really hear data and flow. And really, the idea is to model your application in operations where data flows. And so you will only trigger an operation, a transformation, when your operator, your node, has received the data it needs. So it's gaining back relevance nowadays because we assist uh, in the growth in robotics and uh, more general data processing applications as for instance autonomous vehicles so these two domains really benefit from data flow programming and so because of that we feel it's important to bring it to Zeno. so as i mentioned the key principles of data flow programming is that you model your application as a dilated graph where you have data flowing between operators, between nodes, between computing units. All of these are synonyms. So on the right side, we can really see here uh, a model of an application. So we're going from node A to node B, then to node C, D, and E. And so why is this important in the context of the cloud to thin continuum? Well, we feel it's important because right now your application could go on different layers. It could go from the thing to the edge and to the cloud. For instance, you have a sensor in a farm that, that these would be that would be represented by node A and B. And so this sensor doesn't maybe doesn't have a connectivity or, or regular connectivity to the internet. So maybe it wants to do is send the information it sensed to a node on the edge. That node on the edge could then send uh, aggregates to the cloud for further analysis and so in that scenario we really have three layers and so nowadays in order to bridge these three layers you need to use maybe different communication medium that is if you're not using Zeno and so Zeno exactly as shown in the picture is where we feel there is a benefit you're using the same communication medium for in order to bridge the three layers and so as my colleagues have previously shown you can use it to bring different technologies you can use it to bridge a uh, different programming language and so you're using for your communication the same framework Zeno has other advantages mainly location transparency where you don't need to exactly care where your node will be running you don't need to know its ip address you don't need to know its port all you need to know is the resources it's going to expose and so this is very good but we still have some issues for instance on the thing on the edge and on the cloud you may have to develop in different technologies for instance in the thing you really need something that could go on microcontrollers or a bit higher so such like a raspberry pi and so on the edge, you might have even a different technology. And so if at some point you move, you want to move part of your computations to a different type of hardware or to a different framework, then you have to re-implement your logic. The second issue we are facing is the fact that in order to deploy such application, you need to manually log into every device and start your components and hope that at the end it works. So where we want to go with Genoflow is that we want to unify the abstractions such that you develop your node once and then Xenoflow will take care of deploying it on the different devices you're going to use. This is one of the main benefits. The second is that you will use Xenoflow for the deployment. As in, you will not need to manually log in and start every node. We want Xenoflow to take care of that. So, if we want to summarize where we want to go with Xenoflow, we want to say that Xenoflow is Xeno's data flow programming framework for cloud to thing applications. So really, we want to be able to target every layer of this continuum. We also want to provide unified abstractions. We want to automate and make the deployment location transparent. 
So really what we want to do is like, you don't need to care exactly where, what is the IP address of your devices, Xenoflow will take care of that for you. Just like Xeno, we are built in Rust. So having high performance is something we care about, optimizing the communications to leverage zero copy when it makes sense is something we strive for and as well as low latency. So with this, I've talked about the context. Uh, I've talked about what we want to achieve with Xenoflow. So before we move on to how we technically achieve that, let's talk and agree about some terms. So terminology. So first, what's a data flow in Xenoflow? So a data flow is the representation of your entire application. It is comprised of a set of nodes that are connected by directed links. The icon you see on the right that I will use in the rest of the presentation represents your data flow. A data flow receives a set of inputs and produces a set of outputs. So in Xenoflow, there is a property we would like to keep uh, in, from data flow, which is the fact that it's deterministic, meaning that we want to have for the same set of inputs, the same set of outputs. So the idea is if at some point in your application, you detect an error, you detect a problem, you want to be able to replay it in order to see exactly what was the history, how were the events connected. And so to achieve that, and I don't want to get too much into details, the idea is that when every data is produced, so whenever a data flow receives data, we will associate a timestamp to it such that when you record, the moment you are replaying the data, we will replay it in the same order and at the same pace. All right, so we've agreed on what is a data flow. Now we know that in a data flow, there are nodes and links. So what exactly are nodes and links? So nodes, a node is a computing unit. So Xenoflow supports three specific types of nodes, the source, the thing, the sync, sorry, and the operator. So a source, you can see it as the entry point of your data flow, because this is where you will receive data from the outside world. A sensor is a perfect example of a source. Now, a sync is at the opposite end. So a sync is kind of your exit point of your data flow. This is where you would receive the data and publish it, for instance, in a database or publish it uh, in Xeno. And so this is a sync. So source and sync are different from operators. Operators perform transformations on the data. So this is typically where you would put the business logic of your application. And so source, sync and operator, source and sync are together and versus the operator in the sense that source and sync are mostly in our design, input output bound, IO bound, as in this is where you would really communicate with the network, communicate, write on a file or read from a file. This is where you would do it. Whereas the operators, where you have your business logic, is where you would be constrained by the CPU. This is where you would perform your computation intensive tasks. On the right side, you have the symbols uh, of the source, the sync and the operator. So the squares represent the inputs and outputs. So in orange, we have the outputs, so a source as it's getting information from the outside world and sending it to downstream nodes only has outputs. At the opposite end, the sync only has input nodes, input ports, sorry, uh, because they fetch data from the data flow, they fetch the result and then publish it in a database. Lastly, an operator has inputs and outputs as it's really in between source and sync. All right, so talking about inputs and outputs, how do we connect them? Well, we use links. So a link connects two nodes, specifically a, a link connects an output to an input. And with the constraint for your application that they are of the same type. So Xenoflow does not enforce at runtime the fact that your node, the links connect to input, an input and a, an output and an input of the same type, but for the need of your application, this is a requirement. You need to be able to understand what information you're going to receive. We will talk later in this presentation, especially in the features we want to achieve in 2023, what we want to do with types, specifically uh, in, 
having better support for, for instance, protocol buffers. So to summarize again, not all nodes possess inputs and outputs. So a source only has outputs, a sync only has inputs, and operator has both. All right, so we have the terms out of the way. So now we can move on to an actual implementation. So what is our objective? Well, I've taken the data flow that I've shown before, and I've replaced the nodes with their actual representation according to our own terms. So we can really see here that we have a source A that is producing data, sending it to operator B, that sends it to operator C, that sends it to a sync E, and another operator D. So our goal is to be able to have these different nodes running on the different devices, thing edge and cloud, with these communications. So this is where we want to go. Okay, and so how do we get there? Well, the first step is to create nodes. And let me pause here for a second. So right now we're talking about creating nodes and we are not talking about creating nodes for a data flow in the sense that your nodes don't necessarily, are not necessarily tied to a data flow. Your nodes, you can develop a node and you can reuse it in as many data flow as you want. These operations are completely orthogonal for Xenoflow. All right, now that it's out of the way, moving on. So how do you create a node? In Xenoflow, a node is the combination of two elements, a descriptor, this is this code snippet you can see above, and an actual implementation. For now, in Xenoflow, we support two types of implementation, a shy, shared library developed in Rust or a Python script. So what do you have to specify in a descriptor? Well, first you have to give it an, an ID, a name. Then you have to give a location. So that URI either specifies the location of the shared library or the location of the shared script of the Python, Python script. Notice here that we are using the file scheme. This is because right now Xenoflow requires you to actually move the shared library to the device where you want to run it. This is something that we are going to address in a later release where we want to support other scheme, for instance, HTTPS, specifying a, an ad, a URL address where the node will be able to fetch the shared library. Then you need to specify the inputs and the outputs. So in that case, I'm defining an operator. So it has both inputs and outputs. The only difference with the source and the sync is the inputs and outputs. So a source would only have outputs, whereas a sync will only have inputs. All right, so to create your node, we said that you need a descriptor and implementation that can either be shared library or Python script. We know how to have the descriptor. Now let's move on to the, to the shared operator. So this is the a code snippet in Rust. So there really are three elements in order to create your operator. The first element is the structure. So this defines that my operator has an input, I expect string, and an output that will produce string as well. The export operator macro is to add the symbol that Xenoflow will look for when loading your operator. All right, so we know we have an, an input and an output. Now, how do we create it? Well, that's the purpose of the second part. Here we're implementing the trait, of the operator trait for my operator that has one method which is new in order to tell us how to create it. And so what's important to notice here is that the input that we're taking from the inputs Xenoflow give us, we are providing it a name. And so that name in and the other name out for the outputs is exactly what we have put in the descriptor. So based on that descriptor, Xenoflow will create the necessary structure with the keys being equal to the IDs you have in your descriptor. So if there is a mismatch, Xenoflow will not be able to load your operator. All right, so now we have an operator with input and outputs. Where do we put our business logic? Well, that's the purpose of the third part of the implementation where we implement the node trait that has one method, iteration. So iteration is going to be called in a loop 
by its inner flow. And so what do we do at each iteration of that loop? Well, first, we receive information from our input. In that specific case, we're waiting for one input containing a string. You are not limited to having only one input per operator. You can have as many inputs as required. This part where we receive the input, this is where we have the flexibility, for instance, to do data synchronization. Suppose that you have two cameras and you want to synchronize the frames you receive from the cameras. This is where you would put your logic in order to do it. For instance, analyzing the timestamp and only keeping frames with a very similar timestamps. Now that you have done, you receive your inputs, you need to do your processing and producing an output. So similarly, you don't necessarily have one input and uh, one output. You can have as many outputs as you want. And for instance, a use case for this is you receive your frame and you want to do object detection. Maybe you're going to detect several objects because you are looking for several different objects, which you would send on different outputs. All right. Moving on, now we have the same in Python. So in Python, you have the, exactly the same uh, layout. The two differences are the finalized method and the register method function. So the finalized method is because we're calling this code from Rust, we need to provide you a way in order to properly clean any lingering, for instance, file that were open, uh, socket uh, that were open. And so this, this cleanup, you will do it in the finalize. The register is the equivalent of the macro in Rust, specifying the entry point of your script that Xenoflow is going to look for. Okay, so right now we have our nodes. So for each node that we need in our graph, we have a corresponding descriptor and the uh, implementation that goes with. So either a script in Python or a shared library from Rust code. Know, know that you can definitely mix uh, Rust and Python in your graph. There is no requirement to have everything in one language. You can mix as much as you want. So what comes next? Well, the next step is to have a descriptor of your data flow. So in that descriptor of your data flow, you need to specify the links, where each node is going to run and how they are in which node you're actually going to use. So how do we write one? Well, first, let me insist on one point is the fact that the, this data flow descriptor is a contract. And so what a contract means is that Xenoflow will enforce what is stipulated there. So again, which nodes and where they are defined, the links, and the mapping, which is where each node will run. So what, what does a data flow descriptor look like? So like the following. So we really, again, have three parts. So we have the nodes where we define our sources, our operators, and our sinks. And for each, we have to specify the location of the YAML descriptor. The IDs used here are going to replace the IDs uh, defined in the YAML. And so these are the one we need to specify in the links. So the links, we have a very verbose way of saying, okay, my source, the node my source, its output out is connected to the node my operator and to its input in. The value for the output and the input are the values you have specified in your node descriptor. Once we have all the links, well, the remaining part is to specify the mapping. For instance, in this mapping, we want to have the my source running on the thing, my operator running on the edge, and my thing running on the cloud. How do we achieve, uh, how do we know what to put in next to the my source, my operator, my thing? When you are configuring your Xenoflow plugin, you can specify a name and so that name is actually going to be what you need to put here so in here we assume that you have deployed three xenoflow plugins for the first one you've associated the tag thing the name thing for the second edge and for the last cloud all right so now that we have everything 
it's time for some deployment. So how do we deploy in Xenoflow? So the first thing, so there are here, the elements we will focus on is the fact that we're having Xeno connectivity between the three devices on which we want to run our nodes. So how do we achieve it? For each host, we are going to start a router with the Xenoflow plugin properly configured. So properly configured, meaning at least providing the name we are going to we used in the YAML descriptor of our data flow. Now we also may need to make sure that all routers can communicate to each other. And once we have this, so we know our Xenoflow plugins are configured, we know they can communicate. In order to deploy our data flow, we provide a common line tool, ZFCTL, that we use to launch the data flow. Below is a snapshot of such command. So what is happening then in the background? So once you use ZFCTL launch, what we're going to do is that this tool is going to communicate with a Xeno router and is going to tell it to send this data flow descriptor to each node, to each Xenoflow plugin involved in the data flow, such that each, each plugin knows exactly which node to run. So that's the first step. The second step is we're going each runtime, each plugin is going to create the necessary connections. So notice how we have never talked about the key expressions that uh, you are going to use, that are going to be used by Zeno. That's because Zenoflow will take care of creating these key expressions for you. Another interesting property is that we are going to make these unique, meaning that if you have several data flow that are using the same inputs and outputs, Zenoflow does not care about this and will not mix them. We will create for each a unique identifier and unique for each flow, which also means that if you deploy the same flow several times, there will be no data uh, crossing, there will be no poisoning between the, da the different data flows. All right, so they have created the connection. Then the next step is to create first the sinks. Then once we have created the sinks, we are creating the operators. Once we have created, once we have not created, but launched the operators, we are launching the source. So why we are launching these nodes in that specific order is to prevent data loss. So for instance, by if we had started with the source A and the source A has started producing data before node B and the sync E were connected and running, then maybe the data would have been lost. So in order to prevent that, we're starting the instantiation, the launching of the flow from the sync, and then the operators, and finally the source. All right, we had lots of information until now, being very theoretical on how Xenoflow operates. So I'm going to leave the floor to my colleague, Gabriele, who is going to give you a more hands-on approach as to how Xenoflow operates, giving you a first small example. So Gabriele. Floor is yours. So first, thank you, Julian, for your introduction on Xenoflow. As Julian said, now it's time to actually see Xenoflow in action. But first, let's start with an example of the application that we are going to code now with Xenoflow. Imagine we have one system in which we are recording the temperature in different rooms of a building. And in our system, we would like to use Celsius degree as, as a temperature unit. But it happens that we have some of our sensors are coming from different countries and maybe they're providing readings in Fahrenheit. So what we would like to do is a very simple data flow, like the one shown in this slide at the bottom, in which we have one source of data subscribing to Zeno and getting the data as Fahrenheit. This source of data has one, one output, this little orange box, that is then connected to the input of an operator that is actually doing the conversion between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Then this operator will have an output connected to a sink that will publish this data as Celsius back to Zeno. All of this is will run on a Zenoflow router and will be completely transparent from the 
Zen application point of view. So both the sensor and the subscriber we will have no idea that this conversion is going to happen. They will just publish some data as Fahrenheit while the subscriber is expecting data as Celsius and when the flow is running, we we'll receive this data at Celsius. But as Julian said, Zenoflow has some requirements to respect to Zeno. So it needs to have some components to be installed in order to run. So the first thing that we are going to do is actually to install Zenoflow, Zeno, and their SDK. I'm going to install them through apt. So as you can see, I'm using the apt command to install, apt command to install Zenod, the Zeno storage plugin, the Zeno plugin for Zenoflow, and the Python extension for Zenoflow, as well as the Zenoflow command line tool that we'll use to launch the flow. So now we'll press center, and as already, everything is already installed, just apt tell us, okay, everything is fine. Then we are going to install another utility that is part of the Zenoflow SDK that is called the Cargo Zenoflow. And to install it, we'll use Cargo, this package manager for Rust components. So the Cargo Zenoflow will be installed and will be used to generate, this case is already installed, will be used to generate templates and boilerplates for our operators. So now that everything is installed, let's actually code our operator. So I will have, I have one uh, Visual Studio code connected to the machine. What I will do now, I will use the Cargo Zenoflow to actually create this operator. So first, let me create a directory that I will call new nodes. I will change to this directory. And then I will use cargo Zenoflow to generate for me the template of a Zenoflow operator. So as we can see, I'm actually calling cargo Zenoflow and telling him that I want to create something new, telling with the new keyword, with passing minus K operator because the kind of node I want to create is an operator, minus L Python because I want to create a Python operator and then I'm giving him the name of the operator I want to create, which in this case is my conversion. I press enter and Cargo Zenoflow tells me that he created the boilerplate for the operator my conversion. Now, indeed, if you go inside new nodes, we we'll see that we have a new Python script that is the myconversion.py, which is actually the template created by Zenoflow. Let's quick go quickly through that, the boilerplate. So as we can see, we have some imports coming from Zenoflow for the actual interface that we need to implement, the inputs, the outputs, context information coming from Zenoflow, some Python typing information and async IO that will be useful for doing any async, uh, asynchronous operation. Then we have actually the template generated by Zenoflow, by Cargo Zenoflow, in which we have the name of the operator that we passed and one init function, that is the function that is used to initialize the state of our operator. The set of our operator comprises both the input and the outputs that we are going to use as well as anything else that is useful when running the operator. So in the case of an operator, you can imagine in some AI some AI or ML algorithms, or for instance, some uh, anything that could be useful when actually seeking the operator. Then we have the finalize that as described by Julien is used when we need to actually tear down our operator. So again, this is an operator, so it's not doing any I.O., so usually should not close and open files, but you can also imagine like uh, unloading some ML or AI pipeline from a GPU or from any other accelerators. Then we have our iteration, which is actually the core of the operator, is where the magic is going to happen. So this is the function that is going to be called by Zenoflow every time there is new data. And this is the, the, actually the function that will generate the data in which the operator will compute. And then we have the register function that is an utility function used to export the operator to Zenoflow. So we say that this operator is about converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. So first let me import one utility function that is able to the conversion. So from utilities, I will import Fahrenheit to Celsius is a function that will help us in doing this conversion. Then I need to code my init function. So my operator will have one input and one output. So let's first take the input. So I will call it the input in underscore F, which stands for input Fahrenheit. And I want to get it from inputs dot get. And the input will be called temp underscore 
F, which stands for temperature Fahrenheit. So now I have my input, the input inside my operator. Next, I need my output. So again, self dot out underscore C, which stands for output Celsius. And this will be come from the outputs. And I will ask the temp underscore C output. It's important to understand that the temp underscore F, the temp underscore C has to be defined in the descriptor of this operator. Otherwise, you will get an error where trying to actually run the operator. At this, will be, at, you will be not able to find the input and the output. We don't need anything else from the init, so we can continue to the next function, which is the finalize. In this case, we don't have any internal state, so we could just return none when the function is called. As we don't need to unload anything from the memory, we don't need to close any file. Okay, now let's actually implement the business logic. The business logic, as I said, it will be implemented in the iteration function. So let me remove the boilerplate. So what I will do now is I need to get the data from the input. So I will call it uh, temperature in Fahrenheit. So temp underscore F will come from our input. Our input is an asynchronous function. So we'll just say self dot input in, in underscore F dot receive to receive the data message and then data because I actually want to access the data. Then I want this to store the temperature in Celsius. So I will create a new variable, temp underscore C, that will use our, our function, so F to C, that will take as input the temperature in Fahrenheit and will provide me the temperature in Celsius. Now that I have my temperature in Celsius, I need to send it to the downstream, uh, I need to send for the output. So I will just do await, so again, async function, self dot out underscore C dot send, so sending in the out C, out underscore C, I want to send the data, which is the temperature in Celsius. Then I'm done with the business logic of my operator. So we'll just start the return none because everything went well. So as we have just coded a very simple operator in Xenoflow, but as Julian said, each node of the Xenoflow graph is not only implementation, which is the one that we just wrote, but there is also a descriptor. So what we are, I'm doing now is I will open a descriptor that is already written for convenience. And this is the one that we're going to use for the demo. So I'm, as you can see, I just opened the descriptor for the conversion operator in which we can see there is an ID identifying the, the, the operator, a URI pointing to the implementation of our operator, which in this case is a Python implementation. So it's pointing to a Python script. And then we have our, our inputs that are the same that we just coded in uh, in Python. So we have the temp underscore f, which is one of which is our input as type integer, and we have one output, which is the temp underscore c, which is still an integer. So this descriptor is saying to Zenoflow that this operator implemented in this particular file is expecting one input temp underscore f of type integer, and this providing an output temp underscore c of type int. Okay, that was an operator, but what about the sync and the source that we have in our small data flow graph? So let's start by looking at the source. So we have already a source written here, so I'll go through the code and in particular focusing on the template. So again, we have some imports coming from Xenoflow and from utility function that we are going to use. We have some default parameters that are needed in the, for this particular operator. And then we have the actual implementation of it. Again, we have an init function. We have a finalized function. And we have an iteration. So the function name are similar. But as we can see in the init in particular, the parameters are different. Because this is a source. A source is something that is getting data from the external world and putting it inside the data flow. So it, un it only has outputs. Then in this particular source, I'm subscribing to a Zeno key expression that, as you can see, I'm getting out of the configuration, which is another parameter passed to the init. Then we have a finalized function in which, we, in this case, we are also actually doing nothing. And we have our iteration in which we are using some utility function from Python, in particular the asyncio.slip, because we would want this, uh, opera this source to be periodic. So this, we sleep for some period, and then we send the data to the output. 
Of course, also this source come with a, comes with a descriptor, which we can see now. We have again the ID describing the ID identifying the, the source, a URI pointing to the implementation, and then its output. In this case, we have one single output out of type underscore any underscore, which means that it will match any other types. It's kind of a wildcard. Of course, we have also the sync. The sync is again based on our, in Python and will send data through, through Zeno. So in this case, we still have the init, which is a little bit different from what we have seen in both the operator and the source. In this case, in particular, we see that there is there are only inputs. Why? Because this is a sync. So it's receiving data from the data flow and it's sending data out to the outside world. So that's why it has only inputs. Again, is getting the inputs from its input list and it's configuring some of its parameters from the configuration. Uh, we have a finalized function also on the sync, but also in this case, we are doing nothing. So we're just returning none. The iteration, so the core of our sync is far simpler because we need to wait data coming from the input stream, so sorry, from the inputs, and we'll just then publish this data through Zeno based on some configuration that was created in the initialization. We have seen the three different components, so the source, the operator, and the sync separately. But now we want to, we need to look at them together. So let me open the data flow descriptor for the flow that we are going to start. This data flow descriptor is a little bit more complex compared to the one showed by Julian. So we have, again, a flow identifier, which is a human readable identification for the flow. In this case, it's Fahrenheit to Celsius, which is the thing that we're going to do. Then we have a VARS a, a section, which is about variables. Variables are something that could be useful to, for instance, avoid repeating yourself while writing the data flow. In particular, in this case, is used to avoid writing all the time the base directory to where to find the other descriptors. Then we have a configuration section, which is the configuration that is going to be shared across the different uh, nodes of this graph. Then we have our sources. In this case, we have just one source, which is the Zeno subscriber with its own configuration. So this configuration together with the global one is being used in particular in the Zeno subscription, subscriber in the Zeno publisher. So in our sync, in our source to configure where they are going to publish or subscribe to the data. Then we have, of course, for each component, each node, we have a, a URI pointing to where to find the descriptor, so the descriptor of that specific component. We have one single operator that is the conversion, again, with this ID and this descriptor, and the sync that is very, in this case, is very similar to the source. We have its ID, a configuration with the key expression where it's going to subscribe, uh, sorry, to publish, and the descriptor URI to where to find its descriptor. Then, of course, we need to interconnect these components. So we have the links. We have two links, one going from the Zeno subscriber, so from our source to our conversion operator, and another one going from our conversion operator to our sync, to our Zeno publisher. So now that we have actually seen how to code one operator and how to des the descriptor are written, both for the data flow and for the single component, we can actually start it. So. Here I have different terminals. The terminal that I have on the right, in particular this top right terminal is our sensor. So the one sending data in Fahrenheit. And on the bottom, I have a component that is subscribing to the data in Celsius. In particular case from the same room. So we have this room where the data is being recorded in Fahrenheit. I would like to, to convert it to Celsius. So what we'll do now, we will use Xenoflow to actually start the flow. So we'll use the Xenoflow CTL command, the CTL tool to start it. So what I'm going to say, I'm saying Xenoflow CTL launch this descriptor. That is the descriptor that we have just seen in uh, VS Code. I'll press enter and it will give me a UID. I've, you have seen that while it was giving me the UID, also data started moving on the uh, right bottom uh, terminal, which is the one in which we are subscribing in Celsius. This UID is used to uh, as unique identifier for the flow. So now what we can do with ZFCTL is not only launch the flow, so let me just move the terminal a little bit. We can also inspect, inspect it. So, so ZFCTL, 
get instance because I want to get information about one instance and the UID of the instance. If I press enter, then I will see that more information about the, the uh, data flow is being pr printed. So I have the UID, I have the name, all the operators, the sync and the source composing it and also the link between them. So this shows that you can use actually the Xenoflow command line tool, not only to start or stop flows, but also to inspect what is the status of a flow. Now let's imagine that we are done about converting this data and for some reason we want to stop. What we can do, we can do Xenoflow, Xenoflow CTL destroy and passing the UAD of the instance we want to remove and press enter. This will remove the instance. So we see that this terminal is not receiving data anymore. So we have seen how to actually write an application in Xenoflow. With, with this, this was a very simple application, but Xenoflow can also run on more complex application. In particular, we, have, we will show some two very useful, two very interesting use cases. One that is about autonomous driving. So we have, as we can see in this slide, we have a quite complex graph with a lot of operators, a lot of sources, different operators with a lot of inputs and outputs that are interconnected. And this is the example of a data flow that is using an autonomous vehicle. We have also a video about this data flow running. Oh, sorry. It's going to, yes. So in particular, what we are seeing now is the Carla simulator, which is a simulator for autonomous driving that provides us all the reading, sensor readings. We are feeding these sensor readings to the flow that we shown in the, the slide before, and we are driving the car from a point A to point B. So as we can see, the car starts from a traffic light that is red, the traffic light turns green, so the pipeline is able to understand that now the car can continue. So we'll do a gently turn to the, to the right, and then we will also a little bit in the video switch between the different camera sources that we have. One that is kind of telescopic camera, so it's going to be, it's going to see more in the depth and another one that is a, a camera that is just on the map there. So this show that actually Xenoflow is able also to run a complex application with a lot of data at real time. But not only autonomous vehicle, we have also some use case coming from robotics. In particular, in this, slide, we can see one of the most complex robotic applications we can have in ROS, which is called the Montblanc. It's an example application that comes from a big company, Robotic, and it comprises a lot of interconnection. So you can see there are two sources of data, one sink of data, but 20 operators and 36 links overall, with also some loops and things running on different machines. In particular, in this data flow, we have both a periodic source of data or periodic operator that are going to send data, but also operator that send data only where receiving data on a specific input. And that's pretty much it for the end zone. So now I leave the floor again to Julien that is going to talk about some features of Zenoflow. Thank you, Gabriele. Let me share my, so features. So, with this, we've shown you where we are right now with Xenoflow. We focused on the most important bits and we've had to omit a few of them. And the idea here is to talk more about what we actually can do. So first we talked at the very beginning of this presentation about performance. So Xenoflow is intelligent enough to when two nodes are running on the same plugin to not actually send the data through the network, deserializing serializing and deserializing, but in, instead to exchange this data through channels and hence producing zero copy communications. So we've test uh, our, our very first version of our framework and having these numbers. Now we are performant, but also what we can do is that we can compose operators. So the idea between the composite operators, and for now this just applies to operators, is if you have an, a complex application where you need to have several steps. And so these several steps put together produce maybe a bigger step but that, that is more legible, that you can read more easily. So for instance, 
in the data flow we see on the right, in the, data flow, in the composite operator we see on the right, we have an end operator, which is the composition of an end and a not. So with this, we are allowing users to actually express their their data flow, complex data flow, and split them in several files. <clears throat> so now talking about next steps. So where do we want to go in 2023? So we want to investigate additional type support. So we've been very brief on this aspect, but when your data is crossing the network boundary or the language boundary, you need to serialize it. And you need on the other side to be able to deserialize it and understand it. And so for that, we are providing a way right now in Xenoflow to do it, but we want to maybe have better support for, for instance, protocol buffers or cap and proto in order to facilitate expressing your types, the types that you need in your application using these technologies. Second aspect we want to work on is to improve the developer experience. For instance, allowing the testing of nodes in isolation. You do not want to start your entire application in order to debug it. You, it would be a lot more interesting to provide a default set of inputs, a default, an expected set of outputs, and to match them to check if everything is going smoothly. Error, uh, having providing better errors, for instance, when part of your data flow crashed, and propagating that information to downstream nodes such that you can react is along is in our roadmap. Now, I mentioned in the different descriptors the fact that we're using the file scheme for now, which requires you to actually move the script or the shared library on the plugin, on the device where your plugin is running. And so we want to remove that constraint by providing a node registry. The idea would be to, for instance, use a Xeno storage to store your artifact, so your shared libraries or your script, and specify in your node descriptor the actual location on that registry, which would mean that you no longer have to, before deploying your flow, putting that artifact on your device, but instead say, okay, my artifact is here, you can fetch it at that location. So that's no registry. The other thing we have on our roadmap is tag-based deployment. So right now you have to provide a explicit mapping. You have to say that my node, for instance, want to run on the thing. What we want to be able to do is to associate a set of tags to your node. So for instance, let's say your, your node wants to do uh, artificial intelligence work. So you might need, for instance, PyTorch, and you might need a GPU. So when you deploy, when you develop your node, you have access to these. And so what you want to specify is the fact that it requires PyTorch and it requires a GPU. And so you have this on your node, and then we would put the same on your plugin. You would be able to add a set of tags to indicate, because you have that knowledge, because you know that there is a GPU on the device, you can add the tag GPU. Because you've installed on your device the uh, PyTorch uh, library for Python, then you can also add that tag. And so Xenoflow, based on the tags present on the plugins and the tags present on the nodes, will be able to do a match and to say, okay, that node has these constraints, so I will deploy it on that plugin. This is a small part of the next steps we want to work on. This one, these are the bigger steps we want to work on. And this concludes our presentation about Xenoflow. So do not forget to visit our website before we take in questions. We also have all our code available on the Eclipse Xeno GitHub, and you can talk with us on Discord. So thank you for listening until now. And if there are questions, we can read them on the chat. And I will ask Gabriele to come join me such that we can answer them together. All right. So we have a first question, which is, how does Xenoflow compare to ROS2? So Gabriele. Yes, so we can see Xenoflow as integrating with ROS2. 
So ROS and General ROS2 are very good when you need to develop application that runs inside the robot. When it comes to bridging multiple robots, the situation can become a little bit complex because of network connectivity and select of the topic names and you don't want to mix data between them. So you can see Xenoflow actually as a, as a tool that could be used to integrate and build more complex robotic application like Cooperative Slam or Cooperative Swarm using both ROS and Xenoflow. We are actually studying how to, to provide the, simple integration, the simplest integration as possible with ROS, but for the time being, they are really complementary. Thank you, Gabriele. We have a second question, which is, is the use of Xenoflow limited to robotics and automotive? So no, we are not limiting Xenoflow to these use cases. These are use cases that came to us and that are very interesting and really show what we can do, but that does not mean by all means that we're limited to these. We have actually, we are working in, at, in a European project where we're using Xenoflow for network intelligence for in order to place the virtual network function on. <laughs> yes, so Xenoflow was used, is used actually to get the data from the sensor, getting information about the state of the network, sending this data to uh, some AI algorithms that are elaborating over providing a better utilization of their networking resources. We also have a third question with regard to performance. So do you have any performance comparison with uh, other frameworks? So we'll leave again the floor to you, Gabriele, given your actually researching and publishing <laughs> yes. on that topic. So we had some initial comparison with, uh, with Erdosh in particular, with Xenoflow and Erdosh, and so far we were able to perform better in both terms of latency and throughput. This shows that in general, the design of Xenoflow and after the implementation is quite good, because it's compared quite well with everything that is state of the art, in particular Erdosh. We cannot discuss number as the publication is yet ongoing, but it's quite better. So we have a question. Did you consider using Kubernetes to orchestrate the Xenoflow nodes? This way you could reuse the tag label support already present in Kubernetes. So indeed is something that we investigated is how to integrate with Kubernetes in particular with the uh, customer source definition, so CRDs. And what we would like to do is not, yeah, there is something that we are in, still investigating, is how to expose in general, both the flow concept and the Xenoflow uh, plugin com or instead of runtime concept to Kubernetes in a way that users could still use kubectl and all the facility that comes from Kubernetes to both facilitate the deployment and also in particular in the case of the tag, it will let in uh, extending Xenoflow in an easy way and also extending Kubernetes to understand the flow concept. Yeah, exactly. So, we could also package the operating implementation uh, as containers. It's something that we also studied, but the problem is that as a, if a single, sorry, if a single operator is view, view as a, compo, uh, as a uh, sorry, if a single operator is view as a container, we could have some, I would say, performance issue because we are suddenly have always to go through the, the network. network to send the data between different operators. So this actually depends on the use case. There are use cases in which the performance it of sending always the information through the network is fine, but there are also use cases like in the case of autonomous driving in, in which you have to have more operators running on the same, in this case, in the case of Kubernetes, same container, and then just some of them be outside. As we can imagine, especially in the case of autonomous driving or robotics, let's say the operators that are going to, that have real time need, they need to run almost on the same container because we don't want to to waste any performance and any time in sending serializing data to the network. While some operator, operators that maybe they are doing uh, analytics or AI, they could of course run on another container. So it's something that we are still investigating. We know that you have some traces to follow, but of course it's something that is very interesting also for you, for us. Yep, yeah, indeed, that's, that's also a solution. And to give maybe a bit more hints as to where we are trying to go, at the moment we're looking at how to orchestrate better the the deploy the running of the how we run the nodes in order to provide maybe more leeway in order to maybe respect some real time constraints. But this is all ongoing work. 
seems that we are if there are more questions don't hesitate to put it uh, put them on the chat otherwise we are available with the rest of the Geno team on our discord and we will gladly talk to you more there Thank you everyone for attending. I don't see any more questions, so I suggest we stop here and have a wonderful day. And thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you.